Now the three martini lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome everyone to the Wednesday edition of the three martini lunch. Andrew Johnson of National Review in for Jim Garrity today. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Good, bad, and really crazy martinis for conservatives today, just six days before the 2014 midterm elections. And we have some very good news out of the gate here, and it comes from a place you wouldn't expect, Harvard University's Institute of Politics. Andrew, as, as you well know, one of the demographics President Obama relied upon heavily to win in 2008 and again in 2012 was the youth vote. But after nearly six years of the Obama administration, the young people, the millennials, they're souring on him. The numbers are are fairly dramatic. Millennials that will definitely be voting Tuesday favored Republicans over Democrats, 51 percent to 47 percent. That's a reversal of September 2010 when it was Democrats over Republicans, 55 to 43 Obama's job approval rating among millennials is down to 43 percent. Among those most likely to vote, it's 42 percent. Obama's job approval is below 40 percent on several issues, including the economy, health care, the federal budget deficit, and foreign policy. Nearly six in ten young Americans disapprove of Obamacare. The downside here is that they're not all that excited about going over to uh, the Republicans. They still don't like them very much, but they're starting to see the light here, Andrew, and that's obviously a good thing. This sort of shows the two issues that uh, Democrats would have to face eventually after the youth vote had gone so strongly for Obama, especially in midterms, which the first one is, if Obama's not on the ballot, is the youth vote still going to be as engaged? Are millennials going to want to go out there and and vote and knock doors and and, and be very as enthusiastic as they have in presidential elections? This is showing that they're not. And the other side of it is that the youth vote is not as youthful as it was in 2008 in the <laughs> sense that it's the sixth year of the Obama presidency. The, the honeymoon period is long over. The, the image that and the ideas that they had that President Obama would be have not come to fruition. And so this is sort of just highlighting that the youth vote isn't on board with Democrats as much as they are, especially when the president's not on the ballot and just the president's performance over the last six years, or even if you just want to say the last two since 2012. I mean, again, it has not been a very good two years since he won over Romney that uh, that they're just not as engaged. The other thing I think that's important to highlight uh, that I sort of touched on a little bit was that, uh, you know, again, the youth vote isn't as youthful as it used to be. And I was trying to find it earlier. But if you look back when President Obama was elected in 2008, People voting for the first time this election were were 12 years old. You know, maybe they weren't caught up in the whole Obama euphoria. They weren't on college campuses that Obama was was bringing out. You know, thousands, thousands of of, of of students and whatnot. And if you if you look back to the 2013 Virginia gubernatorial election, it had a really interesting breakdown. Again, I was trying to find it right before this, but I couldn't. 21 to 25 year old voters, McAuliffe won that one. That was between Terry McAuliffe, the Democrat, and Ken Cuccinelli, the Republican. But from about 18 to 21, it was actually even if not Cuccinelli had like a couple point lead. And so I think you almost have a demographic within a demographic, which is that you have sort of the younger millennial voters that weren't caught up in the good old days of, of, of the early Obama presidency. And when Democrats were talk of the town and when George W. Bush was unpopular, they, they were they just weren't a part of that. It wasn't within their their you know peripheral consciousness and so this survey might be an indication of that split within within the youth vote but uh but it's it's interesting to see it's amazing how your perspective will change when you have no job prospects and uh, you're now being forced to buy health care at exorbitant rates yeah i mean and, and yeah and that's why i find interesting about this survey too is that a majority of millennials even disapprove of obamacare i mean as a member of the millennial generation if you had told me that you know four or five years ago and when when everyone Obamacare was the cool thing and all the bumper stickers were Obama cares and, and all that <laughs> stuff, I just wouldn't have thought that. And we'll see what my, what my cohorts do in in the uh, you know in the coming years. I always do like how glowingly they speak about us, though. Um, you know that we're so pragmatic. And I'd be interested to see a poll of what millennials think of other millennials because I don't think we see ourselves <laughs> as that highly regarded. <laughs> You're the trendsetter. You're ahead of this curve. and uh, <laughs> Yeah. Hopefully. I've never been called that before, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On to the bad martini now, Andrew. And it was, a, I guess, probably a couple months ago now when a couple of the uh, missionary doctors and, and uh, the nurse who were found to contract Ebola were brought back to the United States, Emory University. There was some debate about whether or not they should be brought back with Ebola. Ultimately, of course, they were. Ultimately, they were cured. And now 
those two people are giving blood transfusions to these other Ebola patients in the United States, and it seems to be doing a, a great deal of good in their cases. But now the State Department, according to the Washington Times, is apparently looking to broaden the number of people being brought to this country with Ebola, and we're not talking about Americans anymore. Quote, The State Department has quietly made plans to bring Ebola-infected doctors and medical aides to the U.S. for treatment, according to an internal department document that argued the only way to get other countries to send medical teams to West Africa is to promise that the U.S. will be the world's medical backstop. Some countries, quote, are implicitly or explicitly waiting for medevac assurances, unquote, before they will agree to their own medical teams to join U.S. and U.N. aid workers on the ground. The State Department argues in the undated four-page memo, which was reviewed by the Washington Times, it says the U.S. needs to show leadership and act as we are asking others to act by admitting certain non-citizens into the country for medical treatment for Ebola. So, Andrew, they're starting to uh, push the limits of the American people's patience here, I think. It's definitely going to be a tough political message to sell um, that you're going to be bringing in non-U.S. citizens uh, that are Ebola affected to help them. We'll see how much play this gets before the elections, only six days away. But overall, it's going to be a tough message to sell in general. It also raises to question this Ebola, their, their handling of the Ebola crisis. Have they been coming up with this on the fly? Did they have these precautions set in place? This one kind of seems like one that was come up with on the fly, which only further pushes that narrative. This is not something that people were even thought was really a viable option that we would we should take care of, I guess, our, our own people coming back, let alone now opening our doors to more and more. It's going to be tough to sell. And, and again, it, it just raises questions about how this administration has been handling this. There will certainly be questions about whether or not you can create the type of circumstances where patients are successfully treated in the United States back over there, whether it's in West Africa, whether it's in European countries or wherever these doctors might be coming from. But, uh, yeah, it's going to be a, a hard sell, as you said. So, you know, the thing about it actually just last night was, you know, every once in a while there's this, you know, Department of Defense is going over these drills in case there's a zombie attack or a zombie apocalypse. And they seem always prepared for, like, those sort of ridiculous apocalyptic situations. <laughs> but then when we see how they've handled the Ebola, the Ebola situation, they seem to have sort of, you know, little handling and little preparation for how to deal with it. So I was just thinking about that, that we're ready for zombies, but Ebola, we're still, you know, working our way through. I wouldn't be so optimistic if, if the zombies come, Andrew. I'm not sure we're super, <laughs> super prepared for that either. They're more adaptable than you think. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> All right, here we go. Into the crazy martini now. And we do mean crazy because there's six days left before the midterm elections. And so when Democrats are in tight races in the final couple of days, a couple of weeks uh, of a campaign, uh, you can basically bet on two things in the last couple cycles. They'll play the race card, which is happening in North Carolina. They're blaming Tom Tillis for the shooting of Trayvon Martin because he supports a stand your ground law. And in Colorado, NARAL, National Abortion Rights Action League of Colorado, airing this ad against Republican Cory Gardner. They're all out. Did you try the corner market? Of course. Grocery store? Sold out. Drug store? Come on. So everyone sold out of condoms. Hmm. How did this happen? Cory Gardner banned birth control, and now it's all on us guys. And you can't find a condom anywhere. And the pill was just the start. The Pell Grants my little brother was counting on for college? Corey cut them. Climate change that everyone knows is weirding our weather. Corey flat out denies it. Sweet Pea, Corey denies science. Come on. This guy has no idea what's going on in the real world. Don't let Corey's world become your world. Vote by mail today or vote in person November 4th. Keep Corey Gardner out of the Senate and out of your bedroom. Oh, and he's the Republican who wants over-the-counter birth control. Uh, Andrew, what else can we blame Cory Gardner for? One of my favorite things they're also blaming him for is weirding out the weather. <laughs> um, you know, I guess we went from global warming, climate change. Now we're just going to call it, you know, weird weather. <laughs> um, but uh, at least that provides entertainment value. <laughs> and like you said, it's just patently false. It's, it's the same narrative that they push against Republicans, like you said, to Cory Gardner, supports over-the-counter birth control. And it also, one of the things Mark Udall has been uh, push, trying to fight back against is, is actually an image problem. A lot of people have been seeing him as negative, as sort of a downer candidate, uh, while Cory Gardner's kind of had this happy warrior persona to him. He's, he's been quick on his feet. He's been... He's been charming, uh, even even when they've been slinging these these uh, these attacks at him. This ad, if if you're not 
still if you're still laughing through the end of it, it also I don't think casts you all in a very good light because I don't know how any serious person can think uh, this is the route Gardner's going. That <laughs> that drugstores throughout Colorado will be out of birth control, and even when you're or, or condoms, even when you're going there, you had weird weather you had to deal with, and and. <laughs> Oh, man. It's also interesting. I realize the civic education in this country isn't that outstanding, so people probably won't notice it much. But one U.S. senator is going to do all this? Cory Gardner. Yeah. Cory Gardner banned well, birth control as one senator in the U.S. Senate. He's also changing the weather and not allowing Pell Grants anymore. He has a lot of sway for a junior senator <laughs> from, uh, from, from Colorado, if elected. You, you always have to ask why he wasn't doing this in the House, you know. Uh, so we'll see if it works, but uh, but again, at a minimum, it provided entertainment value. It certainly did, and something tells me narrow has got this exact same cut with just different names like uh, Bill Cassidy, Tom Cotton, Joni Ernst, <laughs> Scott Brown, you know, all across the country. They're probably just cutting and pasting all, all these tight Senate races. So fun times. Uh, let's do it again tomorrow. Sounds good. Take it easy. Andrew Johnson in for Jim Garrity. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Please join us again on Thursday for the next... Three Martini Lunch.